All right, Patty, if you'd go ahead and bring up John, we're going to do a real quick thing. Uh, this is uh, We're still working on being Melchizedek. Uh, we're going to step into some things that are very important, and I'll flesh that out after John gets done speaking. He's now in Germany right now, so keep him in your prayers. He's going to be speaking in Germany, then the United Kingdom, and some other places. So God is opening some international doors for him. All right, sweetie. Ah. Hello, I'm John Master Giovanni, and welcome to Seed from the Tree of Life. It's great to be with you. I'm going to be a bit more diligent than I was last week. I said that we were going to start reading from chapter 17, Being a Melchizedek, which is the second to last chapter of Melchizedek, Our Gracious King, Priesthood in Christ, second edition, by the way. Um, and I read a few paragraphs, and before you know it, I started talking again, and we were out of time. So I'm going to try to read a little more, comment a little bit less, so let's get right into this with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll start reading. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I thank you, God, that that's the place that we emanate from. Therefore, we have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive from that dimension and live the incarnation here in this earth. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Open to us now all that you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, last week we were talking a bit about the egoistic program, how Jesus emptied himself, and that's what we're doing. We're emptying ourselves so we can manifest the source of all life, the Father, through Christ in this earth. That's called the incarnation. And it's really uh, powerful and important. Jesus said, I go away and come back to you, but in the status of the greater, the Father. It's not a comparative of one being less and the other one being more. It's an issue of uh, a manifestation of who God is. Up until this point, the apostles, you know, they, or at that point, the disciples, we didn't call them apostles yet. Uh, the disciples were seeing Jesus as the guy that had the goods, so to speak, and they were just following their leader. But what Jesus' ultimate goal was, I am going to go back to the state of being in and with the Father so you now can become the Christ and emanate the Father in the earth. Let's pick that up now. So here's the part one. This is chapter 17 again, being a Melchizedek. Part one, the story of the eternal priesthood. Before there was the world of form and matter, before the world of time and space, there was Christ. Because there was Christ, there was the origin of the order of Melchizedek, the order of the king of righteousness. This is why before there was Moses, a tabernacle, a Levitical priesthood, or a law with a total of 613 commandments, there was just Melchizedek of God, Most High, a king priest of Christ. In Melchizedek, as in Christ, there is only life. There is no death. There is no belief that knowing good and evil will make us more like God. The only reality is that to be in Christ is to already be like God, regardless of any base desires or egoistic cravings. In the beginning, there was Christ who was and is the light. The Christ didn't require any rules to be the light, nor did he need to perform any rituals to be the light. He was the light simply because the Father and the Spirit were united and formed the light. The same is true with the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek wasn't a priest because he fulfilled any rules or performed any rituals. He was the priest of the light because righteousness and peace said so. He was righteous not because he did right, but because in Christ he just was. He lived in peace. Not because he performed commandments and rituals, but because in Christ he was one with God. In the beginning, God desired to share his light, his son. He created the desire to receive it and reflect it. 
This desire was the first installment of the Melchizedekian king priesthood, an order that receives the son and reflects the son. This is why it's always hard to tell a Melchizedek from the son. Is it a theophany or not? When a true Melchizedek is president, you shouldn't be able to tell the difference. This order of Melchizedek was conferred upon several throughout the ages, but one was highlighted for us way back at the beginning with a covenant between Abraham and a person revealed as Melchizedek. He was called Melchizedek not because that was the name given by his corporeal parents, but because that was his identity in Christ. Let's stop there for a moment. I just said, he was called Melchizedek not because that was the name given by his corporeal parents, but because that was his identity in Christ. I just want to take a moment to say how important it is to realize that our identity and Christ are wrapped up together. You cannot separate yourself from Christ and believe you have a different identity any more than Jesus saw himself separate from the Father and Spirit. They are one, you are one. Therefore, we are all one in Christ together. And here's the point. It's not being in Christ or out of Christ. You're always in Christ. You can only think yourself out of Christ, but even when you think you're not, you still are. You didn't create yourself. You didn't put yourself in that position. That's what God has done, but he's given you the choice to perceive it or not. Your identity is Christ. I like to say it this way. If you want to see God, look in the mirror. That's where it begins. Okay, let's go back to this. I'll start preaching. He came to refresh and bless with bread and wine while Abraham gave a gift, a tithe, representing the creative force of God to bless and honor the source. There was no need for a sin sacrifice or a payment for some penalty because there was no law to break or penalty to bear. There wasn't even a race of people, a creed, or a lineage to be espoused. Rather, there was only a reflection of the garden, both giving and receiving, one blessing and refreshing, the other blessing and honoring. The reflection was so clear you couldn't tell the one from the other. A simple resemblance of the garden as it was intended. So who is Melchizedek? What is this person or that? It really doesn't matter who he was before he acquired the designation priest of God Most High, King of Righteousness. What matters is he was a receiver and a reflector of the Son. But it doesn't stop there. Abram heard and believed in the same Most High God and became God's friend. Through covenant, as in marriage, Abram had his name changed and became Abraham. But that wasn't all. A powerful pronouncement came to Abraham. And it wasn't because he kept a list of rules or made sacrifices for his and his family's sins. Rather, it just was. He was now righteous exactly like Melchizedek. Abraham was now a recipient of the son and began learning how to reflect the son. As he did, two more pronouncements were made. The first was that his seed would be the blesser and redeemer of the nations, the revelation of Christ in this world. The second was that he would be the father of faith and the rebirth of the order of Melchizedek. Abraham became a Melchizedek, and he blessed his son, and his son blessed his son, and his son blessed his son, and so on. But there were many fractions of the Adam that had to be touched and welcomed into this blessing of reflection. Most all humans wanted to be like God, but they believed blindly that if they knew good and evil, they would attain a God status either by finding acceptance from God or by being their own God. Yet both approaches were a counterfeit of the reality. To prove the point, God placed his Melchizedekian priesthood into the background and created an ultimate rule book, culled from all the known religions, all violent and bloody, God established one to reveal the death they all possessed. 
with an essential Ten Commandments, which was soon followed by an additional 603 to set out the criteria, with it came the ultimate legalistic priesthood to oversee the rules and a temple that concealed God from the people. Stop there. I just wanted to emphasize as we wrap this up in this session that the Levitical priesthood, its temple, the laws, again, conceal God. It does not reveal God. We have been taught so many times that the law is to reveal who God is and what his nature is like. No, actually, the law conceals God. That temple and that priesthood conceals God. It always puts him behind a veil, and that God is never allowed out. You might say we truly put God in a box at that point and, and lick the seals shut, put a padlock and a chain around it, and said, now there's your God. That's not at all what, what um, the Melchizedekian priesthood does. If anything, it does the complete reverse. It gives us the complete open access to our true self in Christ in the Father. And we're out of time. Finishing with that statement, remember, being your authentic self, which is Christ in the Father, you can never fail because that's who you are created to be and destined to reveal. God bless you and have a fantastic day. Yes, amen. You know, for those of you that don't have the newest edition, John's going to be using the newest edition of Melchizedek. So if you have the original, it may be a little bit different. But what I, if you've been around me a long time, way back when I was still at another church, I, I came across the understanding that just stop trying to be and be. Stop trying to be something that you already are. Because in, your, in our own eyes, so often, we, because of our training, we've been underneath this legalistic burden is all I can say at this point. It was such a burden that it, it just it paralyzed us. And we were always looking at those 613 things, looking at how we don't measure up. I fall short here, 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 and here. And then, and then there's like a PS at the bottom of my falling short. Oh, and there's a couple more. I'm always degrading who Christ says I am, who Christ died and raised again so that I could be raised with him. So imagine me sitting in Jesus' lap in heavenly places, far above every principality, power, and every name of our name, going, yeah, I ain't worthy of this seat. Let me out of here and start trying to crawl out of there. And Jesus is going, what are you, what, what? What are you doing? I, I did this and you raised with me. What kind of thinking are you, you're insane. Stop thinking this way. And that's why, you know, I came to that revelation years ago. It was well over a decade ago. And I said, I'm, not, I'm just going to be. Jesus didn't try to be like his father. He was, naturally. That's the, it says in Second Peter, you know this scripture. We have his divine nature. We're partakers of it. So it's a natural part of who we are. It's not hard to be who you naturally are. Unless... You're deceived up here, and you think you're somebody else. You have a lot of wannabes. I'm not, I'm not slamming cold plays or whatever those things are called. We all dress up like Superman and everything else, okay? That's fun. But when you have an identity that is contrary to the truth of who you are, and you're constantly fighting the, against what God said about you, it gets very confusing. And I love what John had to say about the veil. You know, there was God on a mountain revealing and speaking, and they're like, we don't want that. That's too intense. Moses, you go talk. And what did the people do when Moses went to that, that tent of meeting? They stood at the door and watched him go by. Yep, there's our representative. You go so ahead and you go do that. I don't have to deal with that. And he was, it was inside the tent behind a veil. And who was the only other person that hung out in that tent? Joshua. Joshua was, out of all those folks, was intrigued enough. He wanted to see what was going on. And I, won't, I don't want to go down that bunny trail very far. But, Patty, if you'd bring up that first, uh, that first scripture that I have in the, uh, the app today, I am going to be using that as, as much as possible today. It's uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And I want to talk about the veil. See, within us, we don't see ourselves the way Christ sees us. 
You know, when John said, look in the mirror, that's, that's a representation at the beginning of understanding of God. You know, we go, oh, that's, that's messed up. Yeah, sure. In your opinion, yes. But when God looks at you, he's not, and I'm going to tell you this. I don't have my sunglasses. I know Tony always has them. But if I had a pair of sunglasses, God doesn't have a special pair of glasses. He goes, okay, I'm going to look at humans. I'm going to look at mankind. Give me my glasses. And there's the Jesus glasses. <laughs> okay, I can see them, and I'm not going to be, I'm not burning. Man, that is messed up thinking. Messed up thinking. Jesus isn't the filter so that God can look at us. The completed work is done, and we are a part with them. We are fully involved with them. That veil is on our side. But we all with unveiled faces behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Now you remember, what is glory? One of the words, it's opinion. I knew Penny would be all over that. All right? But what's important here is even when he was, John was talking about Abram, Abram, as it said, was learning to reflect the sun. There is process in our growth. There's process of revelation that comes to us, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, as, when I'm, as I've been going through the process my entire life, being raised in a denomination that sang about how worthless I was and a worm and all the stuff that goes with that, and, and I just walked around, oh, man, I'll tell you, I, I can't believe even God wants to be in the same universe with me. And all of a sudden, and the Holy Spirit's going, Mike, that's not, that's, that's not my opinion. That's not how I feel about you. And then slowly they adjust to my understanding of how how much he loves me and loves you. I mean, Jesus was slamming the religious thing. How many times? I mean, my, one of my favorite scriptures, it gives the Father pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's like he's got, he just flinging it. It's like laughing and happy just to give you the kingdom. He's not going, okay, you get two demerits. And we don't go to God going, thank you, sir, may I have another? No, man, he's dumping. Dumping blessing. You're not having to eat gruel because he's in a bad mood. You're not going through trials and tribulations because he's PO'd, put off. No, the greatest warriors go through the greatest trials to build the strongest and greatest character, to carry the greatest outpouring of kingdom. So if you've gone through Hades and back, and you think you're the only one still smelling like smoke, just recognize it's greatness, because Tempered steel is the strongest. And coal turned into a diamond only happens in pressure. That's the beauty of who you are. I look back across my life and I go, man, I'll tell you, uh, wow. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of hell that went on. A lot of challenges. A lot of difficulties, accusations. But it and even when I was so upset with God I walked away. I only walked away, but I was being followed and dogged by Holy Spirit. See? Never gave up. So there's this thing right here. Our being transformed. This is the this is what I want to talk about in the next couple of weeks. Okay? In this house, I don't know how many years ago it was, a long time ago. We removed the law from our understanding of what we're called to do. We brought ourselves into the understanding of what Jesus said, live out of the pure, true root of love. Give like I give, love like I got love. Okay, that's, that's the only thing he says to us. This is my command, that you love one another like I love. Give in my life. So how does that play out? You know, this was the scary part of, of bringing this house into this understanding is like, most people, because they've been reared in the church, they only know 
the don'ts. They don't know the freedom of who they truly are. So when you take off the, the restrictions, it's like kids going to college. That first couple of weeks, holy mackerel, where's every del Delta Alpha house around? And they, they hit every party that you can imagine. Because they don't know, they got freedom and they don't know what to do with it. And in this house, I've given you and showed you what freedom looked like, but how does that play out? How do I, how do I walk amongst my brothers and sisters without those 6, 13 laws to hold them and to look at them and live with them? Because, man, sometimes, I'll be honest, I get free, I run amok. It's like, yee-hoo, send me into a store with a big old table full of bacon, I'm going to eat till I puke. Because I love bacon. There's freedom to eat bacon. Bacon, bacon, bacon. You think that little dog, you know that little dog commercial about bacon strip? Hey, that was my idea. Bacon, 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 bacon. Bacon. See, freedom gets pretty intense. So this is, I'm making light of this because this is really serious. How can we live with each other in an environment where the only law is, is love? The only standard to live up to is Christ. We're learning, being transformed. How can I walk in the grace for others and myself to be part of that transformation? same image. Are you ready for a religious spirit to come against you when you're in the image of Jesus? That's a hard one. Are you ready for the challenges when somebody has a religious spirit and a dogma and you're living in your freedom and they come in there and they start trying to kick your legs out from how are you going to graciously walk away? It's not easy. The Holy Spirit will fill your mouth in that moment. And you don't rub their nose in it. They don't know any better. That's what they've been trained as. But it's a challenge to go, you know what? My freedom's mine. And I know you have your own freedom. I can't go there. And I won't be burdened by things because my yoke Jesus' yoke, it's a whole lot easier because the yoke that the, Isra the, the, the Jewish people had, the Israelis, and all that whole mess, they themselves couldn't yield under that yoke. How could you expect me? Those are conversations where, where you'll walk through that yourself. So, Patty, if you'd bring up that in the Mirror Bible, that next slide, I like this. I like what Francois says here. The days of window shopping are over. Yes, I like that. You know how women know this window shopping. Guys do it a little different. They go to like the car lot and they're looking for the Ferrari when they can only afford a Ford. Okay? Or Chevy. But they want the fastest thing they can get. So, but the days of window shopping is over, folks. In him, every face is unveiled. In gazing with wonder at the loveliness of God's displayed in human form, we suddenly realize that we are looking into a mirror where every feature of his image articulated in Christ is reflected within us. How do I look at somebody else? Apart from grace, see Christ in you. That's, that's your battle. Just, I'm just highlighting what we have to truly go into. This is the truth of how we walk this out. How do I walk next to a, another pastor or another group of folks that have slightly different criteria and not offend them or be offended by them? This is not a pious attitude. I learned to speak their language. Because not that I'm any smarter than they are. I am far from that. But 
I recognize I'm doing the best I can. They're doing the best they know how. Together we're trying to bring glory to God, the Father. We suddenly realize that we are looking into a mirror. That suddenly is a revelation. Suddenly you have the eyes of the Spirit, not the eyes of your ego, your opinion, not God's opinion. Where every feature of His image articulated in Christ is reflected within us. The Spirit of the Lord engineers this radical transformation. It's the Spirit's job. I'm, I've walked very difficult times with people. I have to help them find Christ in themselves. I have to help them understand that they're living and acting below their true identity. I try to get them out of the mentality that they're a victim. And get them into the understanding they are victorious. Christ is victorious. I have overcome the world. Da 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 da. It's all that stuff. Okay. I try to get their eyes off of their stumbling and get them back on walking. Yeah, we all stumble. We trip over our own feet most of the time. But you know what? We're walking. We are led from an inferior mindset. Man, I'll tell you, that's so true. We are led by Holy Spirit, in my opinion, from an inferior mindset to the revealed endorsement of our authentic identity. That's not that, Kel, um, oh, what's the guy from Pittsburgh? Uh, Carnegie. That's not the Carnegie I'm going to speak myself into existence. It's not that sort of thing. No. But you're sitting there, and all of a sudden, you're in a conversation with Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Father. That's where it works for me. And I'm asking questions. I'm saying, what about this area? What about this part of me? I'm not, this isn't, I don't feel good. And one of them in the conversation, well, Mike, this, how about this? How about this, Mike? How about this? See, the conversation brings a revelation of what they, how they see me and how I truly am. It helps remove that inferior mindset. Because that inferior mindset was birthed out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It has nothing to do about true reality in Christ. Let's say that again. Eating from the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has nothing to do with where we are in Christ. All it does is confuse us. Days, okay, some translations of the scripture read, we are being changed from glory to glory. This would suggest that change is gradual and will more likely take a lifetime, which was the typical thinking that was tra uh, trapped Israel for 40 years in the old wilderness for unbelief. That's true. This isn't a gradual thing. It's like, boom, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I, my mind still says I'm something different. Over here, in God's understanding of me and you, is I'm in Christ. Can't get any more better. Can't get any more righteous. I have everything pertaining to life and godliness to our under, my understanding of him. And his conversation of telling me, no, Mike, that's not true. This is true. And then living out of that truth. See, so many people, we, we, we like dualism. We like to say, yeah, I'm all this, but I'm going to live here. I've got this, but I'm going to do this. See, there's just enough ego still alive that we like to feed it. Well, maybe do you guys don't. Maybe you guys don't. But I'm addicted to bacon. Okay? I'm using bacon because we all have our bacon sauce. Give me a sugar bowl and a spoon. By gum, I'll eat you under the table. Okay? But the truth of that, that's poison. It'll kill me. Your inferior understanding of who you are will disrupt your life. We'll just put it at that. But in the midst of that disruption, when the God comes and says, oh, by the way, revelation comes, you go, wow, I've been like going no place. 
And the man behind the curtain has been telling me all my life that I'm a worthless sinner. Suddenly the curtain's pulled back and God goes, I wasn't behind that curtain there, and I'm not behind the curtain anymore in that one. I am fully face-to-face looking at you as in a mirror so you can see my reflection and your reflection. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. We cannot become more than what we already are in Christ. I love that. We cannot become more than what we already are in Christ. We do not grow more complete. We simply grow in the knowledge of our completeness. If nothing else you hear today, if nothing else that you're taking notes for, I want you to get that last bit. We cannot become more than what we already are in Christ. Stop trying to be and be. Just be. All your walls of protection down, all the facade, the paper mache face that you wear when you come into society or come out of the house, stop it. You're wasting your energy. And most of the time, you're not fooling anybody but yourself. We do not grow more complete, we simply grow in the knowledge of our completeness. It's already done. Just I haven't got the understanding of that yet. I don't know that I am this. This is the beauty of what our relationship is. I was talking to somebody even this morning about what healthy looks like. What does healthy mean to me? Does it mean I have this, 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 all my little boxes checked? No. To be spiritually healthy in my eyes is you're in the conversation. I'm not looking for boxes to check for you guys to see if you're okay. I just want to know you're talking to us. I want you to to be in this last bit. We do not grow more complete. We simply grow in the knowledge of our completeness. That knowledge comes in the conversation. Do I have to pull four hours of being in a closet to do that? I don't know. Maybe you do. Do I have to fast for days on time? I don't know. Do you? If the, in the conversation, God says to do any of those things, do it. Do it. He says to go stand in traffic. I have a question about that. That's right. Discerning the spirits. Thank you, Scott. That ain't God. But if suddenly you're in the middle of a a car accident, if you remember Keto spinning out his truck down there by wherever that was last winter, by Christmas Valley, and it's like, ah, just, you know, and then not not having that car hit him and all that other stuff that happened. Yeah, that was pretty intense. But see, God took care of it. That's the difference. In the moment, you're not setting yourself up it's when the enemy is trying to do something and God intervenes and, and redirects it. Okay? This is where you stop trying and just be. All right, here we go. Bring that next one up, Patty. I'm going to close with this because I love this. This feels good in my heart. When I got, when I got a hold of this, it was like, oh, yeah. Either make the tree sound, healthy, and good, and its fruit sound, healthy, and good, or make the tree rotten, diseased, and bad, and its fruit rotten, diseased, and bad. For the tree is known and recognized and judged by its fruit. I'm going to tell you something, and then I'm going to go into a little story real quick. If you go out in the spring or in the summer, you get an apple off the tree, not going to taste too good, is it? Because it's not ripe yet. You're out of sequence, out of time. So in life, what I am, I am still learning is that I, number one, my ego cannot be used to judge someone else in the season they're in. All I can do is hold their hand as they go through it. That's not easy. Because so many times, my opinion, 
the past was thrown upon them and a yoke that they didn't need was thrown on them. So a lot of times what I do now is I ask questions. And I'll give them some suggestions. They want something. But see, I had someone, a really close friend of mine, really close, ask for scriptures for healing. Give them to me, Pastor, so I can be healed. And I, I went after that, and I worked on it. All right, Father, my good friend I've known for years is asking for scriptures because they truly physically need healing. And you know what the Holy Spirit said to me? The nuggets that they dig out of the Word are far better than anything you could ever give them because they are dug out with their own fingers, and that's their revelation. They cannot live on my revelation. That hurt. There's someone looking to me as a pastor saying, I need some scriptures. You can find them. My answer is, I can't because you can't live off my revelation. You've got to dig your own jewels. You've got to dig your own. Those revelations are only for you. I'm going to to read this. The ugly duckling image of us was an illusion. The ugly duckling image of us was an illusion. Remember the story? We see ourselves as an ugly duckling in this reality. God redeemed the original image he envisioned of you. If you're taking notes, I'm going to say it again so you get this. The ugly duckling image of us was an illusion. God redeemed the original image he envisioned of you, not a remodeled version which carries the brokenness of the one we have become accustomed to. Now that's a lot of words But if you write this down and you think about it, I want the Spirit to reveal this to you. I'm going to say it again because this is the last thing I'm saying today. The ugly duckling image of us was an illusion. God redeemed the original image He envisioned of you, not a remodeled version which carries the brokenness of the one we have become accustomed. Yes. Did you get that, Morgan? Okay, one more time. No, don't ask. I mean, that, this is good. I want you guys. This is one of the most big hammers, four hammers you can rupture up the enemy with. Okay? The ugly duckling image of us was an illusion. God redeemed the original image he envisioned of you, not a remodeled version which carries the brokenness of the one we have become accustomed to. See, we've lived this life in our brokenness. And we believe that's who we are. We live in that place, and it's so hard in my life to be with people and try to share them. And they come up and they, they, try, to, they try to live out of their brokenness. And now what they see themselves as. And I I have to tell them, the brokenness that you have been accustomed to your entire life is not who God sees you as. Life has dictated that is you. But God is recommissioning the true identity. He's not taking all your broken pieces and gluing you back together where you look like something that's a sideshow act. God is redeeming and reminding you of the pure image He has envisioned from the day before you were even a twinkle in His own eye. Because God dreamed of you long before. He envisioned you this way. Life and the world says you're this way. That is the illusion. That you are that you are not worthy, that you're broken, you're hopeless, you're a waste of skin, 
you're a bother to anybody. You're, 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 you're. The world points a finger. God extends a hand. Stand with me if you would. Go ahead and join hands. That's good. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Go ahead and you swing back that way and just put your hand. That's good. That's good. Are we happy? All right. We're good. Yeah. There you go. You can join across the table. Swing on down there. There you go. All right. I'm going to ask you to pray this with me. Whether you believe it or not, it'll eventually your spirit will go, I like that. Are you ready? Little hot hands over there, Ed. All right. So pray this with me. I am not the image that I have seen and been accustomed to my entire life. I am not a reflection of the accuser or the accusations that life has thrown at me. I am the pure reflection of my Father God, and He is well pleased. And I am learning to be pleased with the revelation that He shares with me. In Jesus' name. Love on each other. Hang on to that truth. Make it a reality in Jesus' name.